Hi, this is Mr. Coates, and this is part two of chapter one from AP Environmental Science. And this part is all about economics and how that influences uh, what's going on in the environment. So what we have to look at is how do we balance the environment with, say, all the uses of those resources that we do. So how do we balance like the good of the forest versus the good of the lumber? And so that's what this is all about. And what takes precedence? Uh, basically, we have to come to a balance. We can't say that the forest is more important than the lumber, and we can't say that the lumber is more important than the forest either. So we want to look at what plays a role when it comes to economics and the environment. First thing we want to talk about is growth. Uh, gross domestic product, basically that is how the uh, products of the country are measured. Uh, uh, the services that the country provides is GDP. Now, if we look at how much each person produces for that country, then we call that a per capita. Per capita means per person GDP. Economic development, basically, we, when we use economic growth to improve the standard of living for uh, the country. So obviously, here in the United States, we have a high standard of living. We have a high GDP. We have a high per capita GP, GDP. And the last thing that goes into all this is affluence. Once we do have this high capita G GDP, we have lots of economic development, that gives us the means so we can start buying things. That grows our economy. And a lot of people would argue that economic growth is the most important thing. And after the crash of the housing market in 2008, a lot of people are still on that track, that growth is the most important thing. However, we still have to balance our growth, which with our resource use. So affluence comes into this. When you're affluent, you have the means to buy things. You have the means to use those resources to buy that stuff, to buy the iPod, the fancy car, the boat, the big house. And that's affluence. So we're going to look at these things. When we talk about uh, economic growth around the world, we have to talk about two different types of countries that are out there. The first are the developed countries. This is like the United States, Japan, Australia, Canada, most of Europe. We are considered developed and we have the affluence, we have the GDP, we have the per capita GDP to use a lot of resources and we use these resources to buy things and make things and grow our economy. So we buy fancy cars. Here we have the ability to have good museums and have culture uh, that we can go visit. This is a museum in London. We have the ability to build cities. We have the ability to get a good education. And so that's what developed countries uh, have. Now if we're looking at developing countries, the rest of the world would be considered developing countries. Unfortunately, developing countries have high levels of poverty. They have high levels of hunger. They uh, have a lot of disease. There's a lot of litter, a lot of garbage. Uh, also, the people that live in these countries, they spend a majority of their time trying to find their basic needs, food, water, shelter. So the developing countries don't have the affluence, they don't have the GDP, they may not even have the resources necessary to get there. And so we're looking at the haves versus the have-nots in this case. So if we look at some of the comparison of developing countries and developing countries, we look at population. Currently, right now, the developed countries have 18% of the population, while the rest of the world is in that developing state. This is a huge problem, and this needs to get evened out a little bit better in order to make environmental problems uh, uh, less of, a, uh, of an issue in the, on the planet. Population growth. Most of the population growth is also found in those developing countries. When you start getting these other things, life expectancy, wealth and income, resource use, and pollution and waste, you see those things are all much higher in developed countries. And that's because we have the affluence, we have the medical care, we have the wealth, we have the resource use, we can go and get other resources, we can go and buy other resources. And then we have the ability to make a lot of waste. We currently live in a disposable society. We buy things, they have a limited shelf time on them, like your iPod, it's only good until the next season usually. And then you just throw it away. So we have a lot of pollution and a lot of waste in these countries. If we look at the growing change in uh, eco incomes among these regions, we can see that the income gap between the developing countries, which is North America, Europe, um, is getting larger as time goes on. 
And so as we get more and more affluent, the uh, developing countries, they don't really climb that high. And so this gap is getting further and further apart. And this causes a lot of environmental problems and it also causes a lot of uh, political problems as well. If we look at our per capita energy use, once again, we're looking at energy use per person. Right now, the UAE has the highest energy use per capita, and that's because mostly because they spend a lot of money, but they don't have a whole lot of people that live there compared to the United States and Canada. And so we do have quite a lot of energy use per person, but because we have a lot of people, it puts us a little bit below United Arab Emirates. We go down here and look at some of these other countries. A lot of these countries here are all in, uh, in Europe. And then we start getting down into some of the developing nations where Ethiopians, they basically have hardly any energy use per person. Most of their energy use is from fuel, or fuel wood when they go and collect wood and they burn it to cook food or they don't have any kind of other energy source. So uh, our energy use for those developing countries is so much higher than developed countries. So when we look at poverty versus affluence, we think about resource use. How much of the resource do we use? What types of resources do we use? How do we use them and what do we do with them when we're done with the resource? Food, housing, um, and water. Uh, developed nations have usually pretty good food. They have good water quality. They have good housing quality, whereas those developing nations, a lot of this stuff is not high quality. A lot of it produces disease, and it's a reason for high death rates in those countries. Family life. Affluent families usually uh, have a smaller family, whereas developed con developing countries have large families. And uh, that's a huge problem when we look at uh, population size and growth. Daily tasks and our objectives. Our objectives here in the United States are totally different from objectives you might find somebody in Africa. In the morning in, in Africa, when somebody wakes up, their main goal is to find enough water, enough food, enough firewood in order to survive for that day. They might spend all day just looking for enough water for their family for that day. They may walk five, ten miles in a day just to get enough water. Same thing goes with fuel wood. Right? So that's their objective. Where our daily task, our daily task is to try and get up so we can go work, so we can make some money, or we go to school so we can learn something. And our tasks and objectives between these two groups are totally different. Education. I mentioned this earlier. Affluence. Uh, we have the ability to have a high level of education in this country, and as well as all the other developed countries. Whereas those people in those developing countries, they, the only education they get is how to survive. They don't go to school. They don't uh, go to college. They don't know how to do math. They really just know how to survive. They know how to collect wood. They know how to collect water. They know how to cook. Maybe they know how to do some rudimentary farming but their education is very limited. The environmental impact of both of these though is important. Uh, obviously in an affluent society, we use a lot of the resources, we have a lot of waste, we use a lot of energy, and then in those um, developing countries, their environmental impact is huge too because they are using the resources just to survive and then they don't have the means to clean up uh, major issues with the environment. So environmental impacts are great in both, but they're different types of impacts. So when we start looking at our resource use, one of the things we have to think about is how much resources do we use individually? And the whole resource problem, basically us using too much resource, we have to start looking at this on an individual level. One way we can do this is look at an ecologic footprint. Basically, an ecological footprint allows you to see how much of the world's resources you use, and then if everybody on the planet had the same lifestyle as you, how many planets would we really need? One of your assignments a little bit later will be to go on the computer and figure out what is your ecological footprint based on the amount of resources you use. So uh, this accounts for energy use, it accounts for the amount of pollution that we cause, uh, and the acquisition of those resources. Um, I've done this before and in the past. I consider myself a pretty environmentally friendly guy. I'm not the most friendliest, but I, if everybody on the planet had my lifestyle, 
it takes about five planet Earths to support that uh, type of lifestyle for everybody on the planet. And that's a huge ecological footprint. Pollution is a huge environmental factor when it comes to economics. A lot of times we look at economics and we say that uh, the economy is more important than worrying about uh, pollution. But uh, pollution in the long run, if we look at the cleanup costs and things like that, actually pollution is a lot more expensive than just ignoring it. It seems cheaper in the, in the beginning, but it's really not. If uh, we ignore pollution, then the cost to clean it up later on or remove those pollutants from the environment will way over uh, shadow the cost of not producing those pollutants at all. And there are all kinds of types of pollution out there. We have, uh, we have natural pollution, and obviously we can't really clean that up. Uh, volcanoes, things like that, they put all kinds of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. And we have um, pollution that comes from our water pollution, some stormwater runoff or something from a factory. And then we have air pollution coming from our power plants. So pollution can be a huge problem. In developing countries, pollution is mostly due to uh, unsafe drinking water, uh, due to unsanitary conditions, uh, human waste disposal is not proper, things like that. So pollution can be a big problem caused because of economics. Anthropogenic just means that it's human-caused pollution. So there's a difference between natural and anthropogenic. And anytime you hear the word anthropogenic, you want to think about human cause situations. Now there are other types of pollution out there. We can call it point source. So you can have an anthropogenic point source pollutant here. And so if you have a pollution coming out of a pipe here, that's called a point source. Then you can have a non-point source. If you have like a huge agricultural field and the nitrogen that the farmer put on that to fertilize the crops is running off into the nearest water body, you can't really point to a single pipe or a single smokestack, and so that is called non-point source pollution. So what are the harm from pollution? Obviously, human health is a big issue. If anybody's watched the news lately, China had a huge smog problem this last summer, and they had to wear a mask, and they had an emergency in Beijing for health reasons, and basically they told people not to go out, and it was, it was just this yellow haze everywhere, and it made your lungs burn. So pollution can be a health issue as well. It, we also had issues in the United States this year uh, with water pollution, drinking water, and so that was a big problem. Also, ecosystem health. The ecosystem must run well in order for those resources to be replenished and also for uh, wildlife to have homes and so forth like that. But pollution gets in the way of all this. Also, once again, when you look at the economics of it, it is always much cheaper to prevent the pollution than it is to clean it up in the end. And this goes to a saying that uh, you'll hear a lot in class, but it basically says that there is no away. This means that even though there was a pollutant out there and you no longer see it, that doesn't mean it just went away. That means that it either dispersed, it was diluted, uh, made it might have changed chemical forms, but whatever was out there is still there unless it is dealt with. For example, the trash you throw away every day. Yeah, it disappears when the trash track comes, but where does it go after that? Does it get burned in the incinerator and then uh, the gases from that go into the atmosphere as CO2? Does it get put in the landfill and get buried and then that produces methane? The thing to remember is that just because you don't see it anymore doesn't mean it's not there. Okay, And so there is no away for it any of these things. So this gets us into a concept known as Tragedy of the Commons. Tragedy of the Commons was actually an essay written by a biologist by the name of Garrett Hardin back in 1968. Basically the idea was that there were common resources around the world and uh, these resources are basically used by everybody on the planet but yet no one maintains them. And so what happens is that people use these resources for fear of someone else using them and so they get used very very quickly and they get abused basically in this. So basically it was the abuse of the common property uh, and you have this idea that if I don't use it someone else or you maybe conversely go to, that to, to litter for example. A little bit of litter that I produce is not a big deal so everyone then litters. Uh, you can also see this in this photograph down here of Miami uh, charter boat air 
Let's see how many fish these guys caught. There's one, two, three, four, five, about five different fishermen here, and each one of them probably caught 10 to 12 fish. And the chance of those guys actually eating all of those fish is probably very slim to nil. So they basically abused the fishery just because they could. And they thought that if they didn't catch them, someone else would. Maybe they sold them, which would be good. Um, but this is a, a huge example of tragedy of the commons. Basically overfishing the world's oceans, polluting the world's air, polluting the world's water. These are tragedy of the commons because they're common property that no one really owns and no one really looks so after. What are some ways to, to lower ecological footprint? Affluence people have a very large ecological footprint. And so some of the things that we can do to lower our ecological footprint is that we can use energy uh, efficiently. We can turn off lights when we leave the room. We can change our light bulbs from incandescent to compact fluorescent and maybe even LEDs. We can put in solar. We can recycle. Okay, These are ways to actually reduce our uh, footprint. So reduce is one of the first ways. Reuse things. Instead of throwing things away, reuse it or use it until it breaks. Don't just buy the newest iPhone because you want the newest iPhone. If the old one's still working, why buy the new one for maybe a couple new features? Uh, recycle. Once again, putting things in the proper bins, recycling, so those things can be reused again. We're not wasting those resources and putting them into a landfill or incinerating them. And so paper, plastics, aluminum, a lot of metals, all that stuff can be recycled. It costs a lot less to recycle something than to produce it again from the resource in the ground. So those are the three main R's. This just gets, gets us into some world views. Okay, what do we mean by world view? World view is how people look at the planet. So we're going to look at two world views. There are many more world views out there, but the first one is a planetary world view. Basically, this is the group of people that says that the world's not overpopulated. We don't have a population pro problem. They say that the people are our most valuable resource and technology will save us from all of our problems like pollution, uh, lack of resources. Uh, and by doing this, the technology is going to allow us to support more humans on this planet. So growth is good in this case. This is the planetary worldview. And while some of the technology will probably benefit us and has in the past, um, I think that eventually we will have too many people on the planet. But that's my personal view. Another world stewardship worldview. This says that humans are part of and totally dependent on nature and that nature exists for everyone. So therefore, we are in charge of nature. We are here to make sure that it is here for the future. We are here to use it sustainably, uh, develop ways that uh, pollution is lessened, um, and discourage any kind of uh, degradation to the environment. And this is the stewardship worldview. So in the end, there are five big basic causes of environmental problems, and we've talked about them. The first one is rapid population growth. The next chapter is all about the human population, and we'll talk about all the problems that have been associated with the rapid population growth on the planet. Uh, poverty. We have saw the difference between affluence, those developed countries versus developing countries. And poverty can be a huge problem because uh, lack of education, too many people being born into poverty, uh, lack of resources, and then also the abuse of the land just because you don't have those resources. Excessive and wasteful use of those resources. We do that here in the United States. We waste a huge amount of the resources we have and that we obtain. And uh, we really need to get better as a country in uh, using these things more efficiently. Failure to include the environmental cost of the items in market price. Now this is concept is a little hard to understand, but basically it means that when you buy something, you're not really paying the full environmental cost. So let's say you're buying lumber for your house. If you were to pay the full environmental cost, we would put a price on the habitat that that tree provides for squirrels, for birds, for any insects. We'd also put a price on the soil that it keeps from eroding away. And we'd put a price on the amount of oxygen and the amount of CO2 it uses, the amount of oxygen it puts out. So all those costs then would go into the actual cost of the lumber, not just the harvesting of the lumber the, and the getting it to the market. 
So the full cost, the full environmental cost is not charged to us on those products. If we did pay full environmental cost on these products, we would be a lot more uh, conservation conscious as a society. And then the last part is education. Uh, basically, there are so many people that just don't understand how the earth works. Maybe they had a rudimentary biology course, maybe they just don't care. Uh, but they, they just don't understand the basics of how everything is connected on this planet. And if, if we don't really uh, take care of the planet, the planet's not going to take care of us. And so we need to get that education out there. We need to, to let everybody know that what you do on this planet affects the planet and affects everybody else. And so these are the main problems that we have here on the planet with environment. And I hope this has been interesting for you.